Hi everyone, it's 11 o'clock, so I think we'll get started on our financial track session of the financial track. We're gonna do data analytics and financial analysis. Um, two the two presenters are, we're both from HW and company. Uh, I'm Rachel Smathers, I'm a principal, principal here at HW. My co-presenter will be Michael Shea. We're both part of the nonprofit advisory groups. We're very active in that group. Um, during this session, there'll be three, three code words that please make note of those and send those to Helen if you are in need of CPE credit. If you have questions, please put, put the, post those in the chat. We'll try to get to those at the end, or if not, you can email us afterwards and we'll get back with you, get back with you on those. We're gonna go through what tools and ways that nonprofits can analyze data that they have at their fingertips and or ways to maybe gather more information or data that they may need. Mike will be doing the first section, so I'll hand that over to him. All right, thanks, Rachel. Um, assume everyone can hear me okay. All right, so yeah, we're gonna talk a little bit about uh, data analytics and financial analysis today. Um, there's uh, Rachel and there's me. Um, I usually work out of the Cleveland office actually, but I'm down here in Columbus. So I got a Columbus background here representing Columbus today. Um, so we'll get started with um, just the first part. We're just gonna talk a little bit about analyzing financial information. So, um, you know, as not profit, not for profits, um, I'm sure you do this on a regular basis, monthly, quarterly, uh, annually, maybe you have audits, compilations, reviews um, that you have done. Um, and, you know, you're analyzing that financial information on an ongoing basis, just to see how the, the company's doing and, you know, you're meeting certain uh, financial goals and, and those kinds of things. So we're going to kind of give you some tips, some stuff maybe you're familiar with, maybe some, some stuff maybe you'll learn that are, that, that's a little bit new that maybe you can incorporate into kind of looking at your financials on a regular basis. So, um, you know, one important way to really kind of understand what's, you know, how your organization is doing performance, you know, meeting certain outcomes um, is to look at the financial performance. And so that's, um, you know, that's, that's one of the, one of your key tools that you're probably using uh, regularly, um, you know, to kind of understand how, how things are, how things are going at the organization. Um, you know, it helps to really understand how the organization is doing. Is it trending in the right direction and you're meeting your, your goals, um, you know, certain unusual trends may indicate errors or even fraud in your financial information. Um, you know, and I have this little thing here that I should know because it, it's a vital auditing tool. So as auditors and, and doing reviews and compilations in the a a department, you know, Rachel and I are, you know, constantly doing these kind of analyses as part of our, our audits. And I'm sure you're doing something similar, but we'll kind of share with you some other things maybe you can be looking at to kind of analyze uh, your financial information. Uh, some common ways to analyze your financial information, uh, the easiest way, and this one, if you have like a budget or, you know, even prior year information is doing a year over year fluctuation or a flux or a variance analysis. They're called many different things where you're just looking at maybe two uh, comparable periods or a period to your budget and um, really seeing how, you know, your, your current activity is comparing to either a budget or your prior year. Um, and you can do this on a, uh, you know, a, a two year basis, or you can do as many as, you know, as many years as you want. You wanna do a 10 year trend analysis and see how your activity is trending, that kind of thing. Um, you know, that, that's all part of this sort of a, a fluctuation variance analysis that, um, you know, that, that you can use. Um, another way that uh, we'll get into is, is ratio analysis. Um, you know, which is kind of tied to, you know, doing sort of a fluctuation analysis, but, um, you know, that kind of gives you a little bit more uh, of a different picture of certain financial information, particularly your financial position and your uh, statement of activities and changes in then assets. It can kind of give you kind of an understanding of, of the changes year over year and how, you know, some of those assets, liabilities, revenues, and expenses are are comparing to each other and are the relationships making sense based on your expectations. So flux and ratio analysis. So any tips before I start? Yeah, so um, some things that you wanna make sure before you even start looking at your financial information and you know analyzing it, um, you know, just like anything, um, a good analysis, you wanna start with good information. Um, you know, how many times have you heard the term garbage in, garbage out? I mean, that is, 
um, very crucial to, to doing any kind of um, relevant or accurate financial analysis. Um, so, you know, you want to make sure you have great information um, and, it, you know, that certainly applies here too. So um, some of the things that you want to keep in mind, you know, as, as you're kind of getting started is, you know, you want to have consistent accounting policies. Um, you want to um, apply them on some accepted accounting basis if you can. Um, you know, gap is, is the big one. That's, that's the one that you're going to see most frequently. But there's also cash basis, modified cash basis, and some other ways that you can uh, monitor your financial information. And depending on what your requirements are with, um, you know, needing a gap financial statement for, um, you know, an audit or review or compilation, you may already be tracking on a gap basis. So maybe you've already, already have that. Um, you know, the stronger your accounting policies, your practices, your people, um, the more accurate and relevant your financial information is going to be. So, you know, it's really important to have those, um, you know, policies or capital, you know, having a capitalization policy for your fixed assets, having good policies for, um, you know, your um, accounts receivable and your write-offs and allowance policies. Those all are going to really help um, in, you know, as you apply them to really have you know, comparable information, consistent financial information year over year, so that when you're doing these things, you know, it you can really um, understand the changes um, on a really good level to, to kind of make decisions and understand what's going on. Um, a classified statement of financial position is best. And if you're doing a gap statement, that's usually the, uh, the presentation you can see. And what this simply means is you have current and non-current assets and liabilities. Um, you know, you really can't do a current ratio if you don't have a classified statement of financial position. Um, so we'll talk about the current ratio. That's a, that's a very uh, common ratio that we'll get into. And then finally, um, if you have gap financial statements, you probably remember a couple of years ago, um, the statement of functional expenses, which includes your expenses broken down by three different functions. That's uh, program uh, expenses, general administrative expenses, and fundraising expenses. Um, those that kind of became the standard for GAP uh, a couple of years ago. Um, and so that really required you to kind of analyze your expenses, not only by the natural classification of, you know, utilities, salaries, and wages, but by those three class, three um, functional uh, classifications. So really making sure you have good policies for allocating and um, um, in between the different functions year over year. You know, making sure that you're revisiting those allocations on a regular basis, especially you know if your organization is changing and you have you have different programs coming in, or you know you're you're getting rid of certain other programs and those kinds of things, and your structure of your organization is evolving. Um, it's really important to revisit the functional expense allocations because, in all likelihood, you know your old allocations might not really make sense with um, how your net organization now operates. So you know. This is just having a really good thoughtful practice for your functional expenses is also um, important for doing a really good um, financial analysis. Okay, a couple more tips. You know, if you have a budget, I'm, I'm sure many, many of you do, uh, being a not for profit, um, you know, budgets are usually a pretty important tool to have. Um, doing a flux on your budget on an ongoing basis is, is really, a, really a good thing to do. Um, and you know it's 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 almost it's probably natural for you to be looking at your budget to action on a regular basis if you have one. Um, but you know that's that's always something you want to make sure you incorporate, as well as doing you know a a period over period analysis as well with with analyzing budget to actual as well. So, um, and then finally, um, one of the biggest keys of doing a really good you know financial analysis is making sure you establish your expectations. You want to understand what um, you know what you expect the changes to be year over year um, usually you know you kind of start with the default of you know the the activity should be similar to last year but maybe that's not the case maybe there's certain things that are that are changing and your, your organization is growing and so maybe you expect that your revenue should be higher um, you know over over the prior year if you're comparing those current and prior year numbers um, so you really want to have an understanding of what your expectations are before you you know even start um, doing your analysis so you can kind of work that into your analysis before you start seeing large fluctuations and and trying to understand you know what, what's happening so and then for your ratio analysis um, one thing I always um, point out and, and you can get kind of slipped up with the ratios is that small changes in ratios can really be pretty significant 
So you might see a 0.15 change in a ratio or something like that, but depending on you know what the ratio is, it could be pretty significant. So you want you want to kind of be mindful as you're looking at analysis that um, you know a small ratio change may could be significant. So all right, so here's just kind of a simple uh, year over year flux analysis. Um, I have a statement of financial position here, and um, so we have the uh, assets. And um, just for um, simplicity purposes, our expectation is just going to be that you know the organization um, you know expects everything to be consistent with the prior year, and then from there we have sort of a, a range of acceptability of, of, of fluctuation. So that being within a hundred thousand of, of the prior year, um, you know may, may or may not make sense for this organization, but we're just going to use it for 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 this example here. And then 100,000 and 10%. So if, if I see any changes of over 100,000 and 10% year over year, you know, that's something that we will want either want, you know, want to kind of understand, you know, does that make sense? Is there something happening at the organization? Or is there something that we need to look into or change um, because we're seeing this large change? So you'll see here that the we have uh, 2020 in the first column, 2019 in the second column, and then in the blue columns we have. Um, just our, our flux, our dollar change year over year, and then our percent change next to that. And so you'll see that um, you know all of them are pretty consistent, um, except for under our receivables, we have our receivables broken down between program service revenue and contributions. Um, so you'll see that our program service receivables looks like it did increase um, from the prior year pretty significantly, 335,000. Uh, and 60%. So that's pretty significant. Um, you know, so as you start to try to understand, you know, what's going on with, with that increase there, some things you might realize um, that might be causing it is, oh, you know, during the year we had some issues with our billing process um, and, and maybe we had some issues with uh, uh, staff turnover and those types of things. Um, and, you know, we weren't able to get the bills out quickly enough and we had other people taking over those duties and, and things that just we were trying to transition those things. So maybe those are the types of things you're you're starting to realize as you're looking at that and that's maybe causing these increases. Um, and we'll talk about this in a little more detail, but you know that may start to raise the question of you know what do we have any issues with some of these receivables that maybe been sitting out there for a while because of these issues that just aren't that aren't collectible or maybe we have to look at our our allowance when you know we look at our write-offs and our allowance policy and see you know do we have to um, write some of these off or make some reserves so those are the types of you know questions and and um, things that you you may start to look into as, as you're doing these analyses okay here's a note um, uh, this is the uh, statement of activities and changes in net assets um, so this is uh, just a uh, simple flux on, on the same um, entity with, with just the statement of activities and changing net assets. Um, again, we're just going to use the expectation of, of comparable to the prior year with a $100,000 um, change year over year as kind of our range of you know, uh, acceptability of, of, of what we expect. And you'll see that we have two lines here that um, two lines that kind of went over that, um, that $100,000 change. And the first one is our the contribution revenue went from 3.5 million in 2019 to 3.2 million in 2020, so about a 288 thousand dollar change. You know, pretty pretty significant. Um, it, you know, was only eight and a half percent, but it was something maybe you want to look at anyway. Um, you know, you can kind of use your judgment a little bit in terms of you know maybe not setting hard expectations. Um, you know, when you're doing these analyses, and and maybe you may look at some other things that are. Um, you know, uh, might be out within the expectation range, but you may still want to look at. So that's one maybe we want to look into. And then the other one down in, in our expenses, we've got general administrative expenses decreased about 300,000 uh, over about 10%. So, you know, for this particular example, as we're looking at grant income, you know, we may realize in 2020, uh, you know, the grant and contribution revenue was down due to COVID-19. You know, we were doing a lot of the same marketing and, and um, trying to raise funds through our regular donors and, and some other marketing uh, online and those types of things. 
but it, it just turns out that we just didn't quite raise as much as we did in the prior year. And you know, being two hundred eighty-eight thousand dollars down, that that makes sense considering you know what, what how how the year went with with COVID and and um, grant revenue being down. So maybe that makes sense, and that's that's reasonable. So um, you know, I may refer to contribution income as as grant income. I kind of have the the two uh, labeled differently there. Um, but basically, I'm just talking about any kind of revenue that is um, um, that isn't reciprocal. So, you know, an organization either granting or giving money uh, without necessarily wanting anything in return. Sometimes called gifts, contributions. They can be grants, those types of things. So, um, and then general administrative. So, you know, we had <clears throat> excuse me, we had that decrease of about two point um, three hundred thousand from about two point nine million to two point six million. Um, you know, maybe we realized, yeah, you know, we had lost some administrative people during the year. We lost some people in the accounting department. We didn't necessarily fill those positions as quickly as, as we wanted to. So we had some vacancies. Maybe we had an executive turnover and maybe there was a vacancy for a period of time. So just during the year, you know, we were, uh, had some vacancies that we were looking to fill. Um, and so we had some decreases there and that's why we're seeing general administrative down, something like that. So. You know, it could be many different things. This is just, you know, for an example, how you might go through the process of understanding um, and explaining, you know, what these changes are and how they really relate to what's going on with the organization and operations. Or if it means, you know, you maybe got to look further. Maybe it doesn't make sense. Maybe there's no reason general administrative expense should be down. We didn't have any turnover. You know, let's look further. What's what's going on there? So, but for our purposes, we're just gonna we're gonna make this assumption here that there was some. There's some turnover for our analysis. All right, so that's just kind of your basic uh, flux analysis. Um, so we'll go a little bit into just some ratio analysis. Um, we'll look at some of the, the most common ones, particularly for uh, not-for-profit organizations. Um, so, you know, like a flux analysis is a great place to start, um, but a ratio analysis, will, it'll actually give you an even more um, further insight into your financial trends of the organization. Um, you can use them to compare period to period, um, but then you can also uh, you know, compare them to something like a, a benchmark. And um, you know, the, the ratios can be positive, negative, neutral, just like you know, any kind of uh, flux change. Um, so it's just a matter of understanding what, what the changes are and what caused them. Um, you know, ratios really lend themselves well to benchmarking and um, uh, Rachel go into that a little bit more later on where we talk about benchmarking, which is basically um, you know, how your organization compares to um, some kind of industry benchmark. Um, it could be a, not, a not-for-profit or it could be more specific to your, um, your specific um, you know, part of the not-for-profit um, umbrella. Um, but you know, that information is probably available in different sources, which we'll go into a little bit later. So you'll see as I'm doing these, um, you know, I kind of have a benchmark number that you that that you can kind of compare to ratios and see you know for our kind of uh, uh, example here how that benchmark compares to the ratios that we're calculating um you can analyze these in raw number format or you can use graphs tables charts you know sometimes visualizing the information um, you know if you have excel there's all kinds of graphs and and, and different tools that you can use to put it in uh, pie charts and, and graphs and things like that and that can really kind of help you you know, digest and understand it better. Um, you'll see when we'll go through in our examples, we're just gonna kind of use raw, raw just numbers to, to, to go through the analysis. But, you know, keep that in mind, you can definitely um, use those types of things to make it a little bit easier to digest. Um, and then also, again, just be mindful of the small changes in the ratios um, because they could mean, um, you know, a more significant change than they look. Okay, so this first ratio here is a liquidity ratio called the current ratio. Um, and basically this shows the relationship of your current assets to your current liabilities. Um, for the purposes of our analysis, my benchmark is kind of going to be kind of the guide for my expectation, so to speak, um, just to kind of give us an idea of what you know we expect for this particular uh, uh, not-for-profit organization. Um, so you'll see we have 2020 in the first column and 2019 in the second column, similar to the flux analysis. And the ratio is just, yeah, your current assets divided by current liabilities. And we'll use the same financial information that you saw previously um, on the uh, statement of financial position. 
So you'll see that our current assets and current liabilities uh, for 2020 is 1.6 million. Current liabilities was uh, about 1.1 million. So that's a ratio of 1.47. 2019 comparable ratio is 1.08. So you'll see that the ratio did increase um, quite a bit. I mean, that's, uh, you'll see next to the benchmark is the change from the 2020 to 2019. And then the benchmark to 2020 is, is over here, 0.32. So, you know, pretty significant change. Um, you know, if we go back to our, our slides with the, with, the, uh, with, the, with the statement of financial position, I won't go back there, but we'll just kind of talk through it. The, the big, the big uh, thing here was, your, was the accounts receivable had went up quite significantly. Um, so usually increasing your current assets is a good thing. Um, but for our purposes, as we're, we're, we're trying to see if maybe there's some billing and uncollectible issues, you know, maybe the increase in the current uh, ratio isn't necessarily uh, uh, meaning that uh, a good thing if we have potential write-offs and things. So, you know, you kind of have to look into it a little further as you're looking at that. Um, but um, just to kind of give you an example of, you know, why, why it's increased here. And so we'll go into it a little bit deeper now uh, with the other ratios. Okay. This is a program related uh, ratio. And so what it is, is called program efficiency. And it measures what percentage of your total expenses are program expenses. Um, so basically we're just taking our program service expenses. And again, um, you know, that's one of the three functional expense categories. Um, and you'll see that for 2020, we had 7.6 million over 11.2 million of total expenses. And that's a 0.68 ratio. In 2019 was 0.66, so uh, about a two, a 0.02 uh, increase from the prior year, so not significant. That's you know well within a a reasonable change year over year. Uh, and you'll see that the industry benchmark is 0.7, so pretty close. You know, so that's that's pretty pretty consistent with the industry, pretty consistent year over year, maybe slightly low lower, but you know kind of right there. So that that's kind of a good indication that um, you know things are. Are, are looking as expected with the program service expenses. Okay, uh, another program related ratio um, is gonna be program receivable turnover. And so what this is looking at is how quickly you're turning over your program related receivables into cash receipts during the year. Usually a high ratio is good, meaning that your program revenue is more quickly becoming cash as program revenue is earned. Um, so I'll kind of quickly talk through the, the calculation down here, you know, same format as the previous slide, um, but really what we're doing is we're taking our net serve program service revenue, which doesn't include any of our support contribution grant revenue, but your, your program service revenue, um, and then dividing that by your average receivables. So you'll see we did beginning plus ending divided by two to get to our average receivables. And so that ratio for 2020 is about 12 12.12 and 2019 was 16. So in 2020, we turned over our receivables 12.12 times and 2019, 16 times. So there was a little bit of a slowdown there in the turnover of the receivables. And as we had looked at before, you know, the receivables had increased um, quite a bit um, from the prior year, but you're gonna see that we weren't getting that same um, proportional increase in our net service revenue. It did increase, but not nearly as significantly. And so obviously our turnover has, has slowed because of that. Um, and as we had you know, mentioned in our example here, uh, the employees, you know, you had some employees that left the accounting department, maybe it was an AR person, uh, you know, you had to try and fill that role and you were trying to uh, you know, um, have other people take over some of those duties. And so maybe things had slowed and, and some of the follow-up on the outstanding receivables wasn't wasn't quite as good as it had been in the past. And so again, this really, you know, starts to raise the question um, is, you know, is there any issues with collecting some of these receivables if they've been out there for a long time? Um, you know, is there, is there issues on that end? So that's kind of one, uh, one road you're going to kind of go down as you're, as you're looking at something like this is, is um, you know, the collectability receivables, which is one of the one of the big keys in the, um, the accounts receivable uh, section of your financial statements. And you'll see we have an industry benchmark of 15. So the prior year we were kind of over, and then this year, you know, we fell under because of the decrease in the turnover. 
So with that, this is kind of a, another way to look at the same thing, which is, uh, it's called days and program AR ratio. And it just tells you how many days your revenue was in AR per period before it was converted to cash. So the lower number of days, the faster your AR is turning over. So similar to that, you just take 365 days divided by your program receivable turnover from the prior uh, slide there. And you'll see that it, it basically just converts it instead of how many times it turns over, it, it tells you how many days it takes to turn over. So 2020, we got 30 days. 2019 was better when we only had 23 days with the turnover with a benchmark of 24. And uh, you know, same same kind of uh, picture that we're seeing with the uh, the increase in the turnover and the, in the number of days being due to those um, that turnover in the, in the AR and uh, some of the billing issues. Okay, here's some other um, uh, statement of financial position ratios that, that could be beneficial. Um, this one is a debt ratio called uh, interest expense to average balance of debt. And it, it's pretty self-explanatory. You're just measuring uh, your total interest your total interest rate on all of your debt. And all you do is you take your total interest expense on all of your on all of your um, your, your long-term debt and you divide it by the average debt. Uh, usually when doing an average debt, you would take beginning of the year end of year divided by two. That's usually the easiest way to do that. Um, and so you'll see that from 2019 to 2020, the interest expense had went down quite a bit. So our, our interest on all of our debt for 2019 was 4.17. 2021 went down 3.11. And maybe you remember as you're going through this, oh yeah, we did a, a refinance of the, the debt and at the beginning of 2020, we got a much, we got a much slower rate. Um, Probably at that time, maybe that wasn't the case, but just for our example, we'll, we'll humor that. Um, so anyway, so he had a he had a three percent rate at the beginning of 2020. Um, so it, that makes sense, basically. You're saying, okay, so that makes sense. We were going from a higher rate to a lower rate. We didn't really get any new debt. We just um, um, we just um, refinanced it and got a lower rate. So, um, but for if for some reason you you go through this analysis and realize. That there were really no work, there really weren't any changes in your debt, um, no refinances, no new debt, and this ratio looks like this. You you know you might have to do some digging to figure out what's what's going on. Why would that be? Um, you know, it could be a lot of things. It could be maybe interest expense got posted to a wrong line for part of the year or something like that. Um, so um, that's that's how you might analyze that and have to dig further if for some reason there was there wasn't a change in your debt. Okay. Here's another ratio. Um, this is just debt to net assets without donor restrictions. It's kind of like a debt to equity ratio for not-for-profits. It's, it's a very similar concept. Um, so you want kind of a lower uh, ratio here, which is basically indicating that the organization is, is more supported by um, you know, unrestricted net assets versus debt. Um, so you just take your long-term debt divided by net assets without donor restrictions. And you'll see for 2020, we got 0.92. Um, 2019, we had 1.34. So, you know, overall, we've had, they've had the good increase in uh, changes in net assets year over year, paying down the debt. So it makes sense that, uh, you know, your ratio is decreasing as your equity, uh, as I'm sorry, as your uh, net assets is increasing, your debt is decreasing. Um, you know, usually uh, for this particular um, example, a benchmark of one, so, you know, in 2020, you're below that benchmark, which is a positive good thing because you have a lower ratio than, than the uh, benchmark. So a good trend here. Uh, debt coverage ratio. So this shows the ratio of how, many, uh, how much cash income is available to cover debt and related payments for the following year. Um, you usually want a ratio greater than one. Um, this is a very popular ratio with bank covenants, uh, something very similar to this. You'll see in a lot of uh, your bank covenants if, if you have them. Um, and so the numerator is, is basically, um, in, in general, you'll have change in assets plus depreciation plus amortization. You could have other things as well that are, that are adjusted out of there, like an EBITDA calculation, which is earnings before um, in, income taxes, depreciation, amortization. Um, so basically you're just trying to get to some kind of cash version of your change in net assets, or at least something that's relatively close to that. 
And then you're dividing that by the annual payments, um, principal payments, and any reserve sinking fund requirements if you have something like that. Um, so you'll see for our example here, um, you know, our uh, numerator is 1.1 million versus last year was about 1.083 million. So pretty consistent, a little bit better this year because um, it looks like the income was a little bit better in 2020. So obviously you have a ratio that is very favorable and that and we're close to, uh, in this case, our benchmark of one. Um, so, you know, that's that's something that's that's very good. And, and um, you know, you're, you're very comfortably on the positive side of this particular ratio. Okay. So here's some support and fundraising ratios. Um, so as I mentioned, this, this is just relating some of your income that's you know from either uh, donations, gifts, contributions, grants, those those types of things. Um, so this one here is the support over contribution revenue to total revenue. So you're just looking at the ratio of your support revenue versus total revenue and seeing you know what you know how, how much of revenue is really der derived from uh, support type revenue. And you'll see in this particular case, uh, 2020 was about 0.27. 2019 was 0.29. Um, so you see the ratio is pretty comparable to the prior year and it's in excess of the industry uh, benchmark. Maybe the, um, the organization is kind of designed to be, um, you know, to have a, a, a bigger fundraising arm and drive, um, getting more of its revenue from, from those types of activities and then the industry. So maybe that's just by design, you have more contribution revenue to total revenue. So, you know, might not be a bad thing that you have a ratio that's higher than the benchmark if that's you know how the organization is is um, you know designed. There's another ratio, a fundraising efficiency ratio, and this measures the relationship of money you're bringing in from those fundraising activities to the amount of money that you've spent raising those monies. So you'll see that um, you take um, your total contribution income divided by fundraising expenses. So you'll see for 2020, we got 3.31, 2019, 3.74. Uh, you know, we're looking at an industry benchmark of three. Uh, so, you know, uh, a little bit of a decrease on the um, on the year over year side of about 0.43. And as we had mentioned on the previous slide, when we we're looking at the flux analysis, you know, that makes sense. We, we know that during 2020, we, we had a little bit of trouble raising money because of COVID. But you know, fundraising expense-wise, we had the same team. We were doing all the same fundraising activities, and um, you know, maybe doing them virtually or doing more online. Um, but we were still trying to to raise raise the same amount with pretty much the same resources. So makes sense. Um, and um, you know, there's nothing that's out of the out of the ordinary there as you as you start to look into it. Okay, so here's the fundraising expenses to total expenses ratio, and it's just uh, measures your fundraising expense to total expense. 2020, we had about 0.09, and 2019 was 0.08. The industry benchmark was only, I'm sorry, that should be 0.05, not five. Um, yeah, that's kind of a typo there. And your flux, your flux year over year was pretty consistent, but as we had mentioned before, this particular example, uh, client is, is designed to have more of a fundraising um, uh, capacity to it than maybe some others in the industry and are trying to raise more in the, uh, the contribution grants and, and support side than maybe some others. So by design, you know, the ratio is higher and that, and that makes sense. Okay, here's just a couple on the wages, salaries, and benefits. Um, so you can analyze some of your wages, salaries, and benefits, and you can come up with things like average payroll cost per employee. So that one's pretty self-explanatory. You just take all the wages, salaries, and benefits divided by your average number of employees and come up with an average salary wage for each employee, which includes benefits. Uh, you'll see 33.4 for 2020, 34.153 for 2019, a benchmark of 31,000. You know, a slight decrease. We know there was some turnover in the general admin area. So, you know, that maybe makes sense considering maybe they, they will have a little bit higher salary than some of the program and fundraising people. Maybe not, um, but that's something at this point, maybe that, that makes sense. But uh, we'll go to the next slide and we'll see as we dig down a little bit deeper into the benefits. So similar to the last one, we just figure out what the total benefit cost is per employee. And you just take your total benefits divided by the number of employees. 
And for 2020, you got 5.6, uh, 5,600, or excuse me, 5,694 um, for 2020 and 5,806 for 2019, a benchmark of about 4,000. So you'll see that there is, a, you know, a, we did see there was a slight decrease due to the turnover of the staff. Um, and then just as a, uh, to the benchmark, you'll see it's a little bit higher than, um, than the industry, but the organization is by design has really good benefits and they feel like they offer com, you know, competitive benefits for the industry so that they're not surprised. And, you know, that's, that's um, what they would expect. So, and, you know, at the same time that also, you know, um, explain some of the increase on the last slide for the salaries and wages uh, and salaries and benefits, because it would be part of that as well. Okay, so uh, let's just take a little bit of a breather here. The first code word is data. I'm gonna write that down too, just in case I need it. Um, all right, so I'm just gonna quickly go through data analytics and, and some other things. Won't probably spend too much time on this. Um, just kind of wanna give you a little bit about it. So data analytics is, is the science of discovering and analyzing patterns. And I'm always extracting useful information and data through analysis, modeling, and visualization. So it's just kind of more of a deep dive into your, you know, your general ledger or your accounting information and looking for patterns that might give you some, you know, indication of errors or even fraud, or maybe may help you design, um, you know, better financial reporting processes. Maybe you can analyze your, your data and figure out better ways to record uh, your um, financial information that's maybe more efficient or more effective. You can also use it to monitor customer and vendor activity. Um, so it's really dealing with a lot of your data and trying to uh, summarize it and analyze it in ways to, to come up with uh, uh, things that can help you address fraud and, and changes to, to your processes or even errors and things like that. Uh, one of the big uh, hot button things even now is still Benford's Law as a type of uh, data analytic where you kind of measure the um, uh, populations, um, and you are looking at the first digit of, a, of, of each of the amounts in a population, and they're usually distributed um, in this fashion, one through nine. So a one is likely to be the, the first digit 30% of the time, and nine is likely to be the first digit 4.6% of the time. So if you had a list of your cash disbursements, and you, you pulled one, and you looked at the amount, and you looked at that first number, this um, is telling you that there's a 30% chance that the very first number is one. So, you know, 120 or 10,346 or 100,370 or something like that. So that's really what Benford's Law is telling you. Um, this is the normal distribution of Benford's Law uh, shown in kind of a graph format. Um, so we put in a cash disbursement listing here and we just, um, summarized it and we see that it kind of follows the pattern here. Um, and then this is a non-conforming one. You'll see that the nine in this particular pattern didn't come out. And so you may want to look into what's going on with the nine because this isn't following Benford's law. All right, um, AI is another thing that um, that is really big right now. Um, we won't go much into that. One thing I did want to mention was um, robot process automation, RPAs. This is also called bots. This is basically just um, applications that can be used to kind of automate some of your processes. Um, a great example is QuickBooks. If you use QuickBooks, they offer all kinds of different apps. And some of these apps let you, you know, download information from your bank statements, credit cards automatically, and basically dump them into your, uh, you know, into your accounting records, you know, and basically post all the transactions for you automatically. So things like that, which automate, you know, basically automate certain repetitive processes. And you know, these kinds of things are becoming pretty popular. And they're very easy to implement, uh, you know, small to mid size organizations, um, just because, um, just just by nature of how the transactions are working. So. With that, I'll uh, give this back over to Rachel and she will go through a little bit about dashboard management. So I can keep sharing. Yeah. Okay.
not, oh, sorry. Not the right one. I'm going to quickly go through dashboard management. Dashboard is a could be a very beneficial. Now that you've got through all these ratios and the stuff that Mike went through, ways to put it together um, at, in, in, on a monthly basis, quarterly basis, yearly basis. Uh, it's a, dashboards are very beneficial and can be very powerful management tools. I guess I could, sorry, show my video. <laughs> So a dashboard, it's, it's an informational tool. It's used to track, analyze, and um, display key performance indicators. Metrics and data points gets it all into one place. Um, it's, it's very, it monitors, it helps monitor the overall health of the, the organization, a specific department or a specific process. There's multiple types of dashboards that we'll get through here in, in a minute. But the goal of a dashboard is to del deliver the right data to the right people in the right time frame. And again, like I say, you could do it um, in multiple times during the year. You could do it in different ways and as well to different audiences. You could do it, um, we'll get into it in a minute here. Uh, you could do it internal and external dashboards. Um, behind the scenes, a dashboard, it connects all your files. Um, there's multiple things in systems out there that will bring all these together. It could bring in attachments as well as your um, accounting platform and any application interfaces that you have. It brings it all together and it can be used to transform that data into something that's readable. Um, it can be done in ways of tables and line charts and bubble charts, whatever type of charts that you want, but it makes it into a more usable, readable, uh, fashion for again for your audience if that's management or the board but there's definitely options next code word is analysis why considering using a dashboard as mike went through all those ratios it, it's it is helpful to have it all in one place it, it can help a dashboard can help handle large amounts of information um, you can also see significant data um, quickly. If it's set up correctly, it can be done, uh, like I said, on, on a timely basis um, and have all the information that you need. Dashboards can be shared with donors or grant makers, um, especially at the, at the program level, what that impact is, the scope of the program, as well as, of course, uh, finances are important as well, how you're spending that money. Dashboards aggregate the data um, from multiple data sources, and it's about saving time and seeing all your data together in one place. Uh, ideally, they're presented simply and graphically. Again, it's a little bit easier to read if you see things um, visual versus all just words. Decision makers can uh, see at a glance whether the organization is on its path that's, that it's set out for itself. Um, they focus on conversation, again, at the board, staff levels, clarifying goals, and the strategy of the organization. A dashboard should align definitions of the success across the organization, also encourage dialogue among about the progress towards the goals, uh, facilitate and timely identify successes and challenges, just ground decisions and concrete data and evidence. You know, the, the, the evidence, the data's there, so is the evidence, just getting it all one, in one format and able to be able to um, present it all at once. Also illuminate relationships between different activities or programs, whatever the case may be. Why considering, uh, continuing on with that, a, a successful dashboard, I got some bullet points here. Um, it will eff effectively communicate strategic levels, the results, um, present data in user-friendly manager, excuse me, user-friendly format, um, creates a snapshot of the status. Am I not sharing? Am I not showing? Improves management set of key management, the uh, key performance indicators, key performance indicators are metrics that are specific um, for a company or an organization. Um, their overall, that shows the overall performance and their, their quantitative measurements that are specific, again, to the organization. The successful KPIs um, represent business model drivers. 
And again, that could be at the organization level or that could be at a program level. They reflect uh, progress towards the indi indica indi indicated outcomes. They guide priorities and decisions. Um, and also they're limited to a number that can be realistically, you don't wanna go overboard when you, um, am I not sharing? If you can see it, sorry, I'm just notified you couldn't see my screen. Uh, key performance also have to be re-measured, re-measured on a periodic basis. Um, they aren't forever and they can constantly change as we've seen in the last year and a half, almost two years now, um, the change of the industry of, with the COVID, the impact, um, things are constantly change, changing. So your data also needs to be reevaluated periodically. Examples of type of dashboards there, you've got your strategic or your business intelligence dashboards, program impact, which is a pretty significant one, your, finding, your annual report. Um, that could be done at a department level or a program level or a organizational wide. You got your operational or accountability dashboards. There, I've got a list there that you can see. As well as some analytical dashboards. This is your social, social media presence um, or uh, your website. Um, uh, considering using a dashboard that ref that reflects trends over time or performance against performance against your goals, um, or you could do both. Like I said, you could do multiple dashboards, and, and, and there's so many different ways that they can be set up. An example: I've got a quick example here of a, a financial dashboard. This is a pretty simple, um, straightforward table. Just shows. Um, actually words and numbers, what, what the target is what, six months ago and where it is now. So you can see the improvements. And this one's got some highlight colors for um, indicating whether it's it's on target, it's not, et cetera. Uh, and of course, these would be specific to your organization. What's important, you know, ca days cash on hand is always an important one, where you need to be, what's your target, and as well as Anytime you have reporting requirements or say if you have covenants that you have to monitor, these are good uh, information to include in a dashboard. Another example, a dashboard fundraising. Um, this one's a little bit more on the graphic side. It shows they, they could be very intricate of the various um, ways that it could be set up, but you can see it's kind of hard to see, but the, diff the various years, this is current year versus prior year and where the changes, that kind of thing. A quick slide, um, there's some dashboard tools out there. Like I said, there are a number of out there. There's some that you can pay for a fee. There's a lot of um, accounting softwares that will have add-ons that include these dashboards, as well as there's some that you could do, maybe take a lot more manual input on the, the free dashboards, but they're definitely out there. Benchmarking, we'll quickly go through uh, benchmarking that Mike had mentioned earlier. Uh, benchmarking, it's an ongoing process of measuring an organization. You can do, you can analyze against yourself internal benchmarking, or you can do external benchmarking. Import, internal benchmarking is just as important as external. Um, I know nonprofits have a challenge on the external based on your specific size or how you're structured. Finding the information can be a challenge, but it's, it's definitely out there. It's a matter of whether you're willing to pay for it or, or go dig for it, take the time to find it. Um, Benchmark can be applied in many different aspects for a nonprofit, um, including elements of strategy. So you got your program design and your partnerships, your organizational structure, job descriptions, use of volunteers, as well as performance measurements, your outcomes. Here's a quick graph, a table of types of ben benchmarking, as I mentioned, the internal and the external, as well as is process benchmarking, performance and strategic ben benchmarking. Uh, processing it, identify um, how you perform to others as well as yourself, other programs within your, your organization, um, whether they have the same functional task or objective. Your performance, um, comparing quantitative data, uh, that's a lot of the, the metrics that Mike went through. Strategic, how your organization competes in their, in their marketplace or their specific area, geographical area or, or whatnot. How to benchmark, you got to Clarify the key decisions that will be helpful. Um, ident decide on the key data to gather. It's important that you have the right data. It's not comparable 
then it isn't gonna make much sense. Choose organizations to benchmark. Again, it needs to be more comparable than not. Collect your data, where could you get your data? Um, there's some ideas there of where you can gather data. Analyze and decide, identify opportunities to improve. I mean, if you're gonna benchmark, what, what, are you gonna, what do you plan to do with that information once you get it? Uh, as well as adapt and implement. If, if you see that your peers are doing better in a certain situation, should, should you plan to adapt or change based off of um, whatever your nonprofit's cultures and needs are, but what are the best practices? Benchmarking is useful, to, is used to inform um, specific tr strategic decisions. Um, and some common nonprofit benchmarks that Mike went through got listed there. Some information, uh, some ideas, this is not inclusive list at all, but ideas of where you can gather that information. Last code word is AI. And again, if you have questions, put them in the chat or contact either of us at any time, our contact information, our phone number and email. Thank you for attending this webinar.